Welcome to my introduction on recursion as a programming technique. Uh, in this introduction, I'm going to be breaking down the subject into three basic paradigms that you can use when designing any recursive solution. I'm also going to discuss a little bit about the mechanics of recursion, and this should help you get a better understanding of how your computer interprets the recursive code that you're writing. Now, the first thing you need to understand about recursion is that, well, I can break this down into three points. The first of which is that recursion is just a method of modular programming. And you basically are using recursion to stop yourself from having to write many subroutines that do similar or identical tasks. You could alternatively write any recursive solution as a combination of very similar routines. But instead, by using recursion, you can actually maintain all of that logic in one logical block. The second thing you need to keep in mind with recursion is that any recursive solution can just be written iteratively. The third point is that recursion is a programming paradigm meant to improve readability and not efficiency. In fact, any recursive solution will be less efficient than its iterative counterpart. Uh, however, for some problems, coming up with an iterative solution is just way more complex than a simple recursive solution. However, I do like to say that you know when it comes to computer science, most of your power comes from complexity reduction. In that sense, recursion does give you some sort of power, but not in any sort of efficiency manner, just in the sense that it allows you to write code more easily. So for most programming languages, anytime you call a subroutine from within another body, your computer has to open a new stack frame for that subroutine. And the reason for this is to ensure that the environment or scope of that subroutine is isolated from the parent frame. I'll give you an example of this. Let's say that you have a main method and you declare a variable x. Now you call some subroutine, let's say function 1. In function 1, who was not passed the variable x from the main method, you declare a new variable x and act on it. Once you exit function 1, the main method should still be able to access its original x variable. See, imagine if these stack frames were not isolated, then some other subroutines could just accidentally modify variables of your main method, which would be a security vulnerability. So the first type of recursion that I want to start with is vanilla recursion. With a recursive function, you are continuously putting calls to the same method on the call stack. This is why when you infinitely recurse, like with some sort of infinite loop, your program will typically fail with a stack overflow exception. That is because the call stack literally hit its limit. We'll get more on that in a second, but first I want to introduce our first recursive programming technique, vanilla recursion. Vanilla recursion is the simplest form of recursive programming where you just call a subroutine from within itself. To see a simple example of this, we can look at in order traversal. In order traversal is the prototypical or one of the three main, or I should say four if you count level order traversal, main tree traversals that you might learn in university. It's simply a method of first traversing all the way leftwards down a tree, visiting all of the left nodes first, and then visiting the current calling node, which would be the parent of your leftmost node, and then traveling right, and then once you've hit, gone right once, trying to go as far left as again as you possibly can. In a binary search tree, this gives you the uh, an output that looks ordered. Now let's consider this tree on the left here, rooted at D, and let's take a look at what the stack frame looks like with in order traversal, which uses vanilla recursion. So let's start with our main method. Let's say that the in order traversal method is called from within some main routine. That main routine will open one stack frame for in order traversal. This is our first stack frame for the in order traversal method. So I'd call it stack one in brackets. First, we have to move leftwards down the tree. So we open another stack frame for in order traversal. And our T in this case is B. The second stack frame will, will run to line 23, and then it will open a third stack frame, this time for A. A will also run to line 23, and then it will open a fourth stack frame for A's left child, which we know is null. Since it's null, it will only run to line 22 before terminating. Once it terminates, stack frame 4 is popped off the stack, and we return back to A, starting at where we left off, which was line 23. It will run to line 24, uh, 25 after visiting A at line 24. So it gets added to our output. At 25, we have to add another stack to the uh, stack number five, or sorry, stack frame number five to our call stack, which is A's right child null. At stack five, or stack frame five, it'll run to line 22 before terminating. Now, once this terminates, since A is also at line 25, A will also terminate, terminate meaning we need to pop both 
stack frame five and stack frame, frame three off the call stack. Now we start where B left off at line 23. It'll run to line 25 after having visited B, adding it to their output. At line 25, it'll move rightwards, opening a new frame for C. This is frame six. C operates in the same way as A, opening a frame for its left child, popping it off, visiting C, opening a frame for its right child. One, since T is null, it'll terminate at line 22. Now, since C was last at line 25, it'll also be terminated. And since B was also at line 25, that stack frame, or that routine will also be terminated, so we have to pop all three of these frames off of the call stack. Now we now our first frame, which was paused at line 23, will now resume visiting D, adding it to our output, and then running until line 25, in which case it'll add a call to T right to the to the call stack. This will be our ninth frame in this traversal. The ninth frame will then add two more, one for the left child at line 23, which is null. Since it's null, it'll be popped off without visiting. Then it will visit E, move right, adding our 11th frame to the stack. This will terminate at line 22. Then since uh, frame nine was at line 25, both frame 11 and nine will both be popped off the stack. And also since frame one was at line 25, Frame 11, 9, and 1 will all be popped off the stack when we return back to the scope of our main method. Right, so that's an example of how vanilla recursion works. So if you remember from earlier in this video, I mentioned that any recursive solution is going to be less efficient than its iterative counterpart. And the reason for that is that with recursive solutions, the space complexity that we need to worry about is the size of the call stack. Uh, in the example we just did, the biggest our call stack got was about five frames. Let's say our binary tree was actually a linked list, so it only had right children. In this case, the largest our call stack would get would be five frames. However, let's just suppose for a second that the compiler was smart enough to detect that this was going to be a linked list. If that were the case, then it could optimize this a little bit by popping off the previous frame at line 25 before moving on to the next frame. If that were the case, then the maximum size of the call stack would only be two at any point. Because once we got to line 25, knowing that we don't use anything with the output of that in order traversal call, we could just pop off that frame and move on to the next one, adding it to the call stack. Only keeping two frames on the stack at, at a time, and only one in order traversal frame on the stack at a time. Well, the question then is why don't most compilers actually support tail recursion? And the reason for that is that if you do that, you would lose the stack trace. So for example, continue, consider, the stack or consider this change I've made to the in order traversal function. Let's say that I add like a trivial exception throw to line 22, right? Obviously in this simple example, it's obvious why there's an exception being thrown because I'm literally throwing it. But let's say we were using some more complex recursive function and there's just like some error in our logic. If we were to make this change, our stack trace without tail recursion would look as follows. We'd obviously have our main routine or calling routine. Then we'd have our first frame, the third frame of the inner traversal, our fifth frame of the inner traversal, and then our seventh. At line 22, we have an exception. However, if we were to implement this with tail recursion, this is what our stack trace would look like. We'd have our calling frame, and then we'd have our seventh in order traversal frame at line 22. Now for this trivial example, it doesn't really make too much of a difference because we can tell where the exception is, being, is coming from. But in a more complex example, we want to see that stack trace and see, well, how many calls are, you know, which, what logic did, the, uh, did our code hit in this method before it reached the, the breakpoint? And so in order to maintain the stack trace of not just recursive calls, but of any calls that don't utilize the output of the last method that they call, most programming languages will maintain the stack or maintain the call stack and not use tail recursion so that they can provide a more useful stack trace. This brings us to our next form of recursion, which is counting recursion. Now, while it's functionally the same as any other recursion, just like all these types of recursion are, it follows a different design pattern. This allows us to combine recursive calls through some operator. So like, for example, you know, these could be binary operators like plus, minus, multiplication, division. We have Boolean operators like and or not. 
And they can be non-binary operators like minimum, maximum, or any function. Now, unlike in vanilla recursion, where we simply called a routine directly, counting recursion functions have to return a value that, we, that can be operated on by its parent frames. So, for example, we can take a look at the sum nodes problem. It's a typical problem where we just want to sum the values of all nodes in a binary tree. This is a great application for counting recursion because instead of maintaining a sum value in our constructor, we can simply return, using the counting recursion technique, a sum of recursive calls. Now, the way to visualize what this looks like is if we come back to this tree that we were using earlier, but now let's have added some data values to it, and we call the sum nodes from our main method. In our first frame, we're going to want to return the data at our current node, which is 1, and then the sum of one and some other call to the sum nodes function. Over at this point, the stack frame one has to pause and wait for sum nodes on t left to terminate. You know, and, t, and sum nodes on t left will operate in the same manner, pausing until its left child is available, uh, or its the function over its left child is available. But let's say once that terminates, we would receive the sum of the nodes in the left tree, which is eleven. Now it has to be append now has to be added to the sum of the nodes in the right tree. Again, the call stack has to pause again and wait for the result of sum nodes on t.write. Once that's returned, it'll be added back to our original sum. So counting recursion is a useful way to represent aggregates uh, with any, any sort of operands. So finally, we have pointer recursion. Now this form of recursion mostly pertains to graph or graph-like data structures, which consist of nodes and pointers but it can be generalized, right? even to arrays or maps or any, any data structure, honestly. But I like to call it pointer recursion because generally you think about it in the context of nodes and pointers. So with pointer recursion, we essentially are going to recurse by reassigning, or with these examples, reassigning the nodes of, or the pointers of various nodes in our traversal. Uh, I think a good example of this is the prune trees problem. Now with the prune trees problem, it's a simple uh, binary tree question, it just or it doesn't have to be only related to binary trees, but it asks you to remove all subtrees from a tree that only contain zeros. Now, if we take a look at that tree from earlier, but let's say I've changed the data values to be ones and zeros, we see that if we were to run prune trees on this example, we should have a tree that only has the nodes D and E left. The reason for this is that D's left subtree rooted at B, and B's left subtree and right subtree rooted at A and C only contain zeros. So they should be pruned from this tree. So here's an example solution to prune trees that uses pointer recursion. First, we're gonna check if t is null. If our root is currently null, then we're just gonna return null. Next, we're going to assign to our left child a call to prune trees on t left. We're gonna do the same for t right, a call to prune trees on t dot right. And this is where the pointer recursion technique is coming into play. We're recursing down the tree by reassigning the nodes of our parent. And lastly, the last check just checks that if we're a leaf node and if our value is zero, then we want to be removed from the tree and we do that by returning null. And if we don't want to be removed from the tree, then we do that by returning the node that we were currently inspecting. Now for any trees that are rooted, that only can, some trees that only contain zeros, the parent will have null appended to its left or right child. While for any trees that don't only contain zeros, it'll have its original node reappended back to the tree. Right, so the usage of the pointer recursion here is done through the reassignment of children to the nodes in this tree, for example, in this example. Now using the tree example from earlier, let's take a look at how the prune trees routine would operate on this tree. I would obviously open our first frame, D, then D's left child would be attempted to be set to a new call to prune trees to T dot left. So D's left child's assignment would be pending the completion of frame two, operating on B. Same thing would happen at B, its left child would be pending the completion of frame three, operating on A. Frames four and five would operate on A's left and right child being null, both returning null. And then Frit A would be evaluated to see if it's a leaf node, which it is, and that its data value is zero, which it is. Because of this, it would be returned as null. And B's left assignment would be completed by returning null or assigning it to null. Next, frame five would be or frame six would be opened on C, 
and B's right child would be pending the completion of frame 6. Frame 7 and 8 would both return null, keeping C as a leaf child, or a leaf node, and since C is a leaf node and it contains only a 0, it would be returned as null. So B's right child would be assigned null. Now B would be evaluated. If it's a leaf, a leaf node, which it is because both A and C were removed from the tree, and if its value is 0, which it is, so it would also be returned as null, and frame 2 would be terminated. Now frame 1 can resume and set its left child to the result of frame 2, which is null. Next, it would open D now needs to reassign its right child. So that reassignment would be pending a completion of frame 9. Frame 9 looks at E and checks whether or not it's a leaf child, which it is, or frame 9 would first obviously open frames 10 and 11 to reassign its left and right back to null, and then it would check if E is a leaf child or a leaf node, which it is, and then whether or not its value is zero. Now, since its value is one, it is not returned as null and is actually returning the node itself. So now D's right assignment would be completed, reassigning the node that was originally there. So those are the three types of recursive techniques that you need to solve any recursive problem. Now, if you found this video helpful, don't forget to drop a like and of course, subscribe to see more top video topics on uh, computer science. I plan to start a Java series where I discuss useful tips and tricks that you must know to be a Java software developer. Um, so that's going to be a little bit of a divergence from the more academic videos I've been making. But regardless, you know, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the comment section. I'll be happy to answer them. And as always, have a great day and I'll see you in the next video.